Okay, in this lecture, I will first discuss the <coughs> concept of biocompatibility and I will give you some definitions, useful definitions which are related to biocompatibility and host response. And I will also discuss that what are the different property requirements for a given synthetic material before the biomedical application can be realized. So, biomaterial, the way it is defined, it is as that any natural or synthetic material that interfaces with living tissues. So, I highlight here the word synthetic material, because synthetic material means uh, it is a bone replacement material and this material is fabricated outside the body environment in laboratory or in industry or <coughs> in research labs and so on. And this material does not contain any biological substances like you know cells, proteins, etcetera. And this is purely synthetic material, it can be organic material like polymer based material or it can be inorganic based materials like metals or ceramic based materials. And <coughs> some of the important things in this definition that you need to follow is that it should have a good interface with living tissues. That means, the synthetic materials, it is expected that when it is implanted inside the body environment, that it will, it will establish or it will have good interface with living tissues. Now, these tissues, these are nothing but actually self organization of multiple type of cells. So, you can note down these words like this is self organization of different cell types in a uh, particular fashion and then this is called biological tissues. So, therefore, a synthetic material when it will have interface with tissues, in other words, it will have interface with the self organized layers of different cell types or biological fluid, biological fluid can be serum, biological fluid can be blood, biological fluid can be you know blood serum and etcetera and it should elicit desired biological response. Now, the way desired biological response means it can be different for different type of biomaterial. Just to give an example, when you are talking about total heap replacement, it is supposed to bear the load. When you talk about the heart valves, then it is supposed to facilitate the blood flow in the, in the heart. So, artificial heart valve for that mechanical property is not important, but total heap replacement for that mechanical property is also important uh, after the biocompatibility property. The second thing is that artificial, any artificial bone replacement material that should have a good cell adhesion property and tissue formation property. But when you talk about the artificial art valve, then it should have a property which should not allow blood cells to adhere on that artificial art valve. So, that blood cells cannot coagulate, blood cell cannot form any thrombus on that heart valve surface. So, you understand. So, biocompatibility is a broad term and then it is also application specific. So, for bone replacement materials or total hip replacement, whatever you call it biocompatibility, that kind of concept is not valid when you go to the artificial heart valve applications. Okay. <coughs> so, this thing should be uh, taken into consideration when you design a particular biomaterial. Now, second uh, important uh, definition is that biocompatibility, that is the ability of a material to perform with an appropriate host response. Now, what is host here? Whenever we talk about host, host is the human patient. So, host response and host, whenever you talk about host means it is a human patient or any animal for example. And <coughs> appropriate host response means like this host will not suffer some kind of inflammation just because of the implantation of the material. So, that is what is important and in a specific application. Now, what is the host response? The response of the host organism local or systemic to the implanted material or device. Now, host organism means in the knee joint applications, it is the tissues around the knee or if it is hip joint, that is the tissues around the thigh region of a human patient that is important. How those tissues will react to the implanted material, that is what is known as the host response. So, now you have learned three important definition. Number one, what is meant by biomaterial? Number two, what is meant by biocompatibility? And number three, what is meant by host response? Now, this definition of biocompatibility is more detailed, and I am now giving you a more recent definition that is proposed by David Williams, who is kind, currently the editor in chief of the Journal of Biomaterials. So, the biomaterials, there is a journal, and David Williams is the editor in chief. 
Now, what he proposed the definition of biomaterials is that biocompatibility refers to the ability of a biomaterial to perform its desired function with respect to a medical therapy. Medical therapy means like in a particular application that you are developing this biomaterial for without eliciting any undesirable local or systemic effects in the recipient or beneficiary of the therapy. Who is the recipient or beneficiary? That means it is the host, that is the human patient. But generating the most appropriate beneficial cellular or tissue response in that specific situation means most appropriate beneficial cellular tissue response means whatever is required like you know for uh, bone replacement you want that blood tissues or tissues to grow inside the material or any other material bioreservable material means like you want the material to dissolve and degrade with time in in vivo condition and it should be replaced by the natural tissues which is surrounding that material. So, what he is saying is that it should have a good cellular response or tissue response in a specific situation and optimizing the clinically relevant performance of that therapy. That is what I was trying to mentioning to you a few minutes ago that whatever biocompatibility property you require for hard valve application is different from whatever biocompatibility property that you require for hip replacement or knee replacement for example. Okay. So, these two things should be very clear for any <coughs> for, for may, many students who pursue the research on biomaterials, they always think biocompatibility means it is always the cell addition test, MTT cell viability, but that is important for orthopedic applications, but not for cardiovascular application. Cardiovascular application means like heart valves that I mentioned. For that different type of test is required that is called blood compatibility. So, it is not biocompatibility, but it is again blood compatibility test is required. So, now you understand roughly that you know what is the concept of biocompatibility and why the biocompatibility concept is different for different application. Okay, now, here it is been little bit more defined or described that you know that ability of a material to perform that compatibility or harmony of the biomaterial with the living systems. Living system means that is the human being system. Now, there are two types of compatibility. What they have defined here, one is the surface compatibility and one is the structure compatibility. Now, surface compatibility means like, now let us go back to the example that I have given you in the earlier lecture, like where I have discussed the total hip replacement. You have the titanium stem and on the top of it, you have this hydroxapatite surface coating. So, the bulk composition is titanium, surface composition is hydroxapatite. So, what I am meaning here by surface compatibility is that it is not the biocompatibility property of titanium here is not important, but it is important whatever hydroxapatite coating you are putting on the surface of titanium. That is what I am trying to say here. So, that is the chemical, physical or biological suitability of the implant surface to that host tissue that is important. So, here host tissue will not see titanium directly, here host tissue will first experience a hydroxapatite coatings before it will see the titanium substrate. The second one is the structure compatibility. Structure compatibility means that is the optimal adaptation to the mechanical behavior of the host tissue. Mechanical behavior means like you know what is the response, mechanical response of the tissue or the bone surrounding that. That is what I was mentioning in the last lecture that you have the elastic modulus of the cortical bone that is 3 to 80 giga Pascal. Now, if your elastic modulus of the implant is too high, then implant will bear most of the load, not the bone. And as a result, your implant will be detached from the uh, surrounding bone. So, that is what it is important that your optimal adaptation to the mechanical behavior of the host tissue or host bone, bone is nothing but a heart tissue. So, this bone, how this is optimally adapted as far as the mechanical properties is concerned, that is what is meant by structure compatibility. Now, you see that there are two things, one is the surface compatibility and one is structure compatibility. Structure compatibility mostly means for the load bearing implants, how mechanical adaptation process is possible. Okay. Now, here is a biocompatibility interactions, what I have uh, shown here that one is your biomaterial and one is the material function. Material function can be your two things, one is that biological function biological properties. Biological properties means what is the, you know, that how the cells will grow on the surface or how this bacteria will be adhering on the surface, etcetera. 
and you have the mechanical properties also like what is the elastic modular strength etc and then one is the patient patient is your human patient so patient is your living tissues or living organs so in biological terms you can replace the patient by living tissues or living organs material function means that is your biological property mechanical properties your biomaterial means it is your synthetic material right and this synthetic material you are actually fabricating outside the human body and this synthetic material what is the manufacturing processes that i have explained to you in the last lecture that is you know for metals it is the standard casting rolling etc for ceramics it is more powder based methods like you know processing like powder processing sintering and so on so now there is the intersection of these three and this intersection region is this one what i have been now shaded now these intersections is nothing but what is your biocompatibility property is important where biomaterial it should have a suitable composition it should have a suitable or desired material function like in terms of biological properties and mechanical properties and that should match with the specific tissues or specific biomaterials organs where you are implanting this biomaterial into the human patient you understand so that is that common area or common subset of this three actually will reflect in the biocompatibility property so i am giving you all these slides so that you can have a fairly good understanding of this what is meant by the biocompatibility property but in your laboratory scale experiments you do not use any patient things right so that's why it is called in vitro in vitro experiments means like it is a simulated environment of the patient's one so as i said that what is in vitro and what is in vivo now typically in literature you will find that there are a lot of in vitro experiments and in vivo experiments are not that significant in numbers compared to in vitro experiments because in vivo experiments that required you know ethical committee clearance and that animals which is not very easy to handle and so on so in vitro experiments the way it is defined as that it is the laboratory scale simulated experiments now what is meant by simulated you are essentially trying to simulate as close as environment possible which is prevailing in the human patient or human body so therefore as i have explained to you in the first lecture that human body that core temperature is 37 degree celsius the ph of the blood is maintained as 7.4 and therefore most of the in vitro experiments that you carry out so whether it is cell culture whether it's the in vitro dissolution everything there the temperature is always maintained at 37 degree celsius ph is always maintained at 7.4 and to give you further details like cell culture experiments they are maintained at 5% co2 level and 95% air why because that that also simulates exactly that co2 level inside the human body so human body if the co2 level is more than 5% that means your human organs are not functioning well that's why co2 level has increased so that is the optimum level of co2 that is always available inside the human body and that is the reason you require 5% co2 in your cell culture experiments right so laboratory scale experiments no animal involved and also this in vitro experiments the other thing is that it is very rapid and mostly initial screening experiments because animal means you are sacrificing some animals for your in vivo experiments and that is not good right so you should first do the in vitro experiments you select the best material out of this in vitro experiments then you do in vivo experiments that is the logical sequence of doing the biological testing it is inexpensive in vitro experiments and it is poor representation of physiological conditions why it is poor representation because i have mentioned in the last to last lecture that in a human body environment your ph of 7.4 is only maintained at blood but that ph also changes depending on whether it's urine whether it is gastric en environment or gastric fluid etc etc so ph 7.4 is not constantly maintained all the time inside the human environment and second thing is that temperature 37 degree celsius is also not maintained throughout the human body so again that is also grossly gro grossly poor representation of the physiological environment third point is that 
normally all human tissues they are actually uh, aggregates of different cell types but your cell culture or bacteria culture you are always using only one cell line you are not using multiple cell lines together during your cell culture or bacteria culture experiments right so all these things actually shows you that it is a poor representation of the physiological conditions however it is always a good as a first step then in vivo experiments like animal experiments animal experiments means like you can use rabbit you can use rat you can use mouse before you can go for the human trial so now you all you always start with the smaller animal smaller animal means like rat then you go to little bigger element like rabbit then you can go the for the largest element is called largest animal is called an human being now wh why i am putting this stress on the small animal to me intermediate animal to large animal because if you talk to any clinician or medical practitioner they always tell you that rabbit model experiments rabbit model experiment means that is the intermediate animal model of experiments that you are doing in the rabbit in case of rabbit because smaller the animal lesser the complexity of the body environment in terms of ph variation in terms of temperature variation and so on larger the animal larger will be the volume, larger will be the variation because the larger the animal more the volume of the body that you are dealing the smaller the animal it is the smaller the volume of the body environment that you are dealing with so the variation will not be that significant when you are talking with the help of the human being so that is what is meant by you know that is the different in vivo animal models that you really want to use now it has a demanding protocols like animal welfare act you have to follow you have to also get the clearance of the ethical committee and so on the right animal model actually approximate human environment and it is a second step prior to the clinical use clinical use means like in the human beings now in vivo testing in vitro tests cannot replace in vivo tests why because in the in vitro test you cannot simulate that whether there is any inflammation or not inflammation can only be realized when you put the material inside the human body or inside the any animal okay second one there is no immune response immune response means you are not dealing with any immune system immune system means that is inside the human body or inside the any animal so there is you cannot you cannot study the any immune or histological response of any material third point that i already mentioned that in vitro test always deals with the single cell type let's say it is a connective tissue cells like fibroblast if it is a bone cell type that is osteoblast cells but it does not it does not involve multiple cell types in the single experiments that is what is missing in the in vitro experiments number fourth is that there is no tissue remodeling tissue remodeling means i will come back to this later when i'll discuss little bit of the tissue engineering concept T tissue remodeling means you are not giving enough environment or enough biological environment so that there is a e ecm that is extracellular matrix formation and there is remodeling of the extracellular matrix composition all the time dynamic so no dynamic changes in the extracellular matrix that is possible in the in vitro experiments now in vivo test whereas provides interactions of the different cell types that i have already mentioned effects of hormonal factors interactions with extracellular matrix that is not possible in the case of in vitro test interaction with blood borne cells proteins and different biological molecules all these things makes in vivo experiments much more meaningful and much more complicated okay so in summary i must mention here that whenever you do the in vitro test you cannot definitely say on the basis of your in vitro test that yes this material will be extremely suitable for in vivo applications because your in vitro test can be very positive but that does not ensure that your in vivo test also will be positive because in the in vivo test you have some additional parameters which will be involved and that will significantly influence the biological performance or biological properties of any biomaterial okay so the underlying theme this is the like very final level understanding that your in vitro test only can say that in this simulated environments this material has good biological properties it does not ensure that this material will be clinically successful 
for some load bearing implants or some blood, from blood sorry from heart valves and so on. So, for that you need to use the suitable in vivo test in a particular animal model and you can start with the small animal to go to large intermediate animal go to the large animal model experiment. Now, general property requirements of the implant materials as I have been mentioning right from the beginning the biocompatibility is the most important property that a material must have before it can be used for biomedical application. Now, biocompatibility property you now have broadly understood that what is meant by biocompatibility, what is the textbook definition of biocompatibility, how it is properly de defined. The second one is that it should have a extremely high corrosion and wear resistance. Now, this is more appropriate for load bearing implants, because in the load bearing implants your material also many times experience some reciprocatory motion like in the acetabular cup, femoral ball, those kind of combinations which I have mentioned for THR or total knee replacement. So, total knee replacement or total hip replacement your wear resistance is also important. Third one as I said elastic modulus. So, elastic modulus matching with the neighboring bone or cortical bone that is important. Fourth one is that high fatigue and compressive strength again I have told you for load bearing implants. So, fatigue strength I have shown you remember that fatigue strength in the if you do the normal laboratory environments without sea water you can measure high fatigue strength, but when you use the sodium chloride rich sea water kind of environment then you are bound to have much lower fatigue strength compared to that in air. So, again you the material which experiences very high fatigue strength in air that should not be the design criteria, design criteria should be what would be the fatigue strength in the simulated body fluid environment. Last one is the density, I also mentioned the density just to give an example or to refresh your memory that steel based material that has a density of 7.8, whereas alumina is a density of 3.9 which is just half that of the steel. So, therefore, same volume of implant will weigh less if we use ceramic compared to metals. And if the weight is less, the patient will be feeling more comfortable for the same implant if it performs well. This is the you know kind of a snapshot view of that what are the property requirements for biomaterials. Now, here I have mentioned that elastic modulus is around 30 to 80 giga Pascal. This is depending on what is the kind of specific applications. Now, density is 3 to 4 gram per cc that is more relevant for ceramic based materials. Fracture toughness it should be more than 3 MPa square root meter, because if you remember your cortical bone the fracture toughness that varies around 2 to 12 MPa square root meter. So, if it is more than 3 MPa square root meter it is better. Fracture strength it should be as high as possible, so that it can be used for load bearing application like 200 MPa. Hardness should be more than 4 giga Pascal, because the typically bone are soft and bone does not have very good, uh, very high hardness property. Now, in vitro property, first one it should be non cytotoxic, non cytotoxic means cyto means cell, toxic means it should not have any undesirable toxic effect. So, it should not have any cytotoxic property that means their cells should survive well when you will sit these cells on this material surface. Then second point is the cell adhesion like fibroblast or osteoblast cells. Now, the type of cells also depend on what kind of applications that you will be using. For example, fibroblast cells are the most connective tissue cells and these connective tissue cells are actually uh, the cell lines which comes to the wound site very fast, very promptly before the osteoblast cell lines. Osteoblast cells are the bone forming cells. Osteo means bone, osteoblast means bone forming cells, fibroblast means again fibro means it is the cells of the fibrous tissue or the connective tissue. So, that way you can remember these typical biological names. Third one is that calcium phosphate rich layer formation in SVF, like whenever you do any in vitro dissolution experiments, you first check whether this biomaterial is capable of forming any calcium phosphate rich layer formation. Irrespective of the composition, if that biomaterial can have calcium phosphate rich layer formation, then what will have? It will have very good 
osteological or it, it will have very good biological response when you put it in in vivo conditions. Because in vivo conditions also, it will first form calcium phosphate rich layer formation. If it is calcium phosphate rich layer formation, then what the neighboring tissues or bones will feel? Because each bone also will have 65 percent calcium phosphate. So, the bone will find as if that similar composition is existing next to the synthetic material and therefore, it will have good bonding or good bo biological bonding with between the tissue or bone along with, with the synthetic biomaterial. Fourth one is that hemocompatibility, hemo means blood, blood compatibility, but again that is only applicable for the heart valve applications, not for other type of uh, applications, it is not the primary criteria. In vivo property means this should have a biomineralized layer or bone like layer formation. It should have a biological interface or bone apposition and it should have a control degradability. So, I will show you later that when a biomaterial you implant inside the human body, then this biomaterial should have good bone formation or new bone. New bone means that is new type of bone which was not existing before you put the implant in the human body. So, if this new bone is formed, then it should have a good in vivo biocompatibility property. So, like you know this is like you know overall view of the different property requirements of the biomaterial. This is like more details about the what is the different bone analog materials. Now, the property requirement for different bone analog materials, it can be so there are you know 3, 3 plus 2, 5 plus 3, 8 circles surrounding this. So, that means 8 different aspects you need to take care when you are actually developing bone analog material. Bone analog means it is like bone replacement materials. You are developing materials for using as a like a natural bone. First one is a processing. Now, processing means it should have a good processability to make complex shapes. Remember, bone does not have a very simple shapes like rod like shape or typical circular type shape, but bone can have a very complex shape. So, whatever material that you are producing in the laboratory scale, you should be able to produce it in a much more complex shape than simple shape. Second one, CAT CAM based designing to produce desired shapes and porosity. CAT CAM means computer aided design and computer aided manufacturing. So, this computer aided designing, you can develop the materials with controlled porosity using the CAT code, that computer aided design code or computer aided manufacturing process. Third one, whenever you use the hydroxapatite coating, you should have a optimum thickness and it should have a good substrate coating interface and integrity. That must be ensured before good processing, before this material can be used in real applications. When it comes to microstructure, it is important that whether you have a presence of a biocompatible or non-toxic phases. Because if you have alpha, beta, gamma phase, if one of the alpha, beta, gamma phase has a toxicity effect, then the entire material will have a cytotoxic effect. So, you cannot use this material in real applications. Then second one is a microporosity. Microporosity means any pores which is less than 10 micron and macroporosity means any pores which is in the range of 40 to 100 micron. So, if it is less than 10 micron porosity, then it is very good for initial cell adhesion property. If it is greater than 40 to 100 micron porosity, this is macroporous, then it is very good for nutrition and nutrients and blood channels, everything to enter and tissue formation and tissue in growth also to take place. Third one, for the hydroxapatite based materials, it is important to have a combination of hydroxapatite and TCP phase. What we call is that BCP, that is a bicalcium phosphate phase and this bicalcium phosphate phase is important for this hydroxapatite based materials. Now, coming to the physical properties, physical properties means lower density that I have mentioned, elastic modulus is 70 to 80 giga Pascal, that I have mentioned why it is required. For many load bearing applications, compressive strength is important as well as flexural strength is also important. Fracture toughness means it is the resistance to the crack growth and this resistance to the crack growth should be as high as 3 MPa square root meter or more. Now, coming to the other properties is like electrical properties. Now, the question is that why electrical properties is important? Bone itself is a piezoelectric composite of the organic and inorganic phase and piezoelectric composite means this bone analog material should have a dielectric constant which is around 1000 or more. 
it should have electrical conductivity property which should have a 0 0.04 ohm inverse per meter and it should have a piezoelectric coefficient which is somewhere around 0 0.5 to 0 0.7. So, these combination of properties if it is ensured in this synthetic biomaterials, then what will happen? This biomaterial would be an ideal bone material. Now, uh, this four is mostly from the physical and electrical and functional and mechanical properties as well as the processing. Now, these four in vitro properties, antimicrobial properties, in vitro properties is more is the bio oriented properties. Now, these are all like physical and biological pro physical properties mostly as well as the processing. Now, in the biological properties, first point to note here is that in vitro biomineralization. In vitro biomineralization means First of all, in vitro means laboratory scale simulated environment. Biomineralization means it should ideally uh, be able to form apatite layer at the early stage of incubation in SBF. Many times, some biomaterials they take four weeks before they can form calcium phosphate rich layer formation. There are two or three type of materials, let us say A, B, C. Some material they take one week form that calcium phosphate rich layer formation. Another material they take three weeks, another material they take six weeks. But the first material which it takes one week of one week for the formation of calcium phosphate rich layer formation that material is highly biocompatible compared to other two materials there is no way that you can quantify or there is a, any quantification index or how good biomaterial is bioactive or not but this is the way you can roughly find out that how you can evaluate the biomedical potential of a good biomaterial then second one is the less leaching of ions like you know if the ions are leached and if the ions can cause some toxic effect that is also should be avoided. So, therefore, that less leaching of ions should be preferred. Coming to the other part of the biological properties is called in vitro biocompatibility property like first one is the cellular functionality. Cellular functionality means it is a better expression of MTT which is a cellular viability property or ALP that is the osteogenic differentiation or osteoblast differentiation and osteocalcin that is the bone mineralization property. Now, all these assays I will be dealing with it much later in more details. Now, there is a good cell fed processes like whenever you will seed the cells on the biomaterial it should be able to migrate, cells should be able to migrate shells should be able to differentiate on the contact with biomaterial, shells should be able to proliferate also. So, all this is called in combination like proliferation, migration or adhesion or differentiation, all these properties together is called cell fate processes. So, this is like a biological term, cell fate is nothing but combination of proliferation, then migration, differentiation and cell adhesion. Next one is the antimicrobial properties. Last lecture I have mentioned that hydroxyapatite is the most biocompatible material or most bioactive material, but the problem with hydroxyapatite is that it does not have any antimicrobial property. Anti antimicrobial property means whenever you see bacteria cells on this hydroxyapatite surface, then what will happen? These bacteria cells can easily adhere and they can easily survive on the biomaterial surface. So, that can cause infection in the whenever you are implanting in the human body. But if you add some silver to hydroxyapatite, they should be able to kill the, all the bacteria. So, you get a material with antimicrobial property. Third one is that in vivo biocompatibility property, like it should not cause any inflammation, it should ideally cause new bone formation that is the new bone that is formed during the early stage of implantation and third one is a good integrity of the natural bone or implant surface. So, that integrity means there should not be any gap suppose this is your biomaterial and this is your human bone. So, this interface should be continuous there should not be any gap between the biomaterial as well as the natural bone. So, this is what I meant by good structural integrity at the natural bone implant interface. Okay, as I said that biological tissues they contain <coughs> the self organized aggregates of the multiple cell types and a large number of cells in a particular fashion. So, therefore, it is important to first understand the properties of the cells and what is meant by cell, biological cell. Now, here I am giving you a definition. Biological cell is a self content unit which is capable of duplicating itself given the proper nutrients and environment. 
and in general cells are enclosed by lipid bilayer so that is important because cell membranes they have a lipid bilayer and they contain the necessary genetic material now this necessary genetic material it is enclosed in the nucleus so that is the dna rna right and this genetic material can direct the continued propagation of the cell continued propagation of the cell means the cell will go through a cycle right cell will differentiate then cell will go to the death or cell necrosis and so on so that entire entire cell cycle is also governed by that how this genetic material they will perform so there are two things here you can find out that you know cell membrane they contain lipid bilayer and cell is a self contained unit which is capable of duplicating itself because it contains a necessary genetic material first let us see that how this plant cell and animal cell they look like now this plant cell typically has a very regular type of structure whereas animal cell it has it does not have any regular structure it is more like irregular structure this you are seeing like a thin section of a animal cell now it also has a nucleus and nucleus is enclosed by a nuclear membrane you have the cytoplasm which is inside the cell you have the mitochondria you have the golgi body all those things you can see in the next slide this is the molecular biology of the cell so you have the lipid bilayer that is the cell membrane right it is contained by the cell membrane which is nothing but a lipid bilayer here and this lipid bilayer also has a particular properties that i'll come later now this entire cellular uh, entire cell it is the matrix of the cell which you can call as a matrix which is called the cytoplasm so essentially cytoplasm means that it is actually the entire matrix of the cell then you have the one of the important organelles is the nucleus now nucleus again is enclosed by nuclear envelope and it is a nucleus and you have the entire material which is inside the nucleus is called nucleoplasm now this nucleus i will come back to later that nucleus also has a nuclear pore or that means this membrane whatever you are saying it is not a very compact layer it has also some pores inside the nucleus there are some of the important organelles of this inside the cells which are called cellular organelles for example this is called microtubules so these microtubules are contained in the cytoplasm so it is one of the component of the cytoplasm other component of the cytoplasm is called actin filament so these are like called actin filaments here then you have the ribosome then what is the called protein synthesis then you have called golgi apparatus now this golgi apparatus is as close to the cell as possible and you have the large number of mitochondria here and mitochondria is called the power house of the cell right because it is used in the atp synthesis and atp synthesis will lead to the more energy that the cell requires for its survival what are the other things that you have see that you have the intermediate filaments you have the actin filaments and you have the this is intermediate filaments this is the part of the mitochond uh, cytoplasm you have the actin filaments that is also part of the cytoplasm now there is the other things these organelles this irregular shaped organelles these are called er which is called as the endoplasmic reticulum okay and you have the mitochondrion here you have this chromatin that is contained that is nothing but dna which is inside so you have the three components of the cytoplasm let me summarize these components one is the microtubule actin filaments and intermediate filaments okay you have the other important thing is that called golgi apparatus then other important cellular organ is called endoplasmic reticulum from the energy point of view it is important to have the mitochondria in the material and outside you can see that is called extracellular matrix what is known as the ecm it is designated as the ecm because many times later on i'll refer this ecm and ecm actually essentially means it is extracellular matrix this is also another cell type i mean for different cell type the cellular surface or cell size or the cell morphology is also different it does not necessarily mean that all the cells will have this kind of unique size or shape and this size you can see this is like 5 micron this is the size so the entire dimension of the cells can be as high as 100 micron or little higher than 100 micron okay now here you can see this is the more kind of regular circular type of cell morphology 
and what is more important you can see that the cell membrane which contains this lipid bilayer this you can clearly see here now again you can see more clearly the golgi apparatus you can see the mitochondria in this here and also endoplasmic reticulum which is uh, which is surrounding the cellular nucleus and you have the nucleoplasm here inside the nucleus so nucleus contains the genetic material that is required for the gene related activity like dna rna etc now those you have also studied in your school biology but this is important to recall all the important features of the cell biology here now other things is that major intracellular compartments they are kind of separated by permeable membranes now if you go back to this particular view graph or here you can see mitochondria if you look at the mitochondria morphology here then mitochondria is also contained by a envelope which differentiates from the cytoplasm here so each mitochondria you can see a membrane just like a cell is enclosed by a membrane similarly all these cellular organelles also are enclosed by some membrane also if you see here the golgi apparatus and nuclear nucleus that is the another important cellular organelles and this nucleus is also enclosed by a nucleus membrane so that is also another membrane so that is what is meant by here that major intracellular compartments they are separated by a permeable membrane and this has been shown here like you know this is a plasma membrane this is a nucleus and this is a er that is the endoplasmic reticulum this is you have a mitochondria and you have the endosomes here which are also some small elements you have the cytosol cyto means cell sol means it is a like a you know matrix of the cell you have the golgi apparatus you have endoplasmic reticulum with membrane bound polyribosomes you have the nucleus okay this is the structure of the cytoskeleton in eukaryotic cells and this cytoskeleton it has a different organelles as well as this entire structure of the cytoskeleton it has three different components as i said that it contains the actin filaments then you have the intermediate filaments and then third one if you go back to this slide i have already mentioned that it is a microtubules these three components these actually microtubules is the third component these three components they contain in the cytoskeleton now here it shows that how these various organelles they actually look like in reality so this is like a more like a shoe type of morphology in the mitochondria and it is the powerhouse of the cell you have the rrna synthesis region and you have the nuclear envelope now nuclear envelope you can see these are these contains lot of pores either it can be macro pores it can be micro pores you have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum it has a very complex type of structure which is also there and you have a rough endoplasmic reticulum which does not have a very smooth surface it is more like a rough surface here this is a structure of a lipid bilayer which is the part of the cellular membrane and this membrane actually contains lot of proteins you have a glycoproteins which is part of this cellular membranes you have the transmembrane channel protein what is meant by transmembrane channel protein like this protein is actually part of one cell as well as the part of the neighboring cell so like it is shared between two neighboring cell that's why it's called transmembrane cell protein then you have the inner membrane protein and you have the this is called the lipid bilayer bilayer means as the name suggests it has two layer it is composed of two layer one is the top layer one is the bottom layer and each layer contains a number of different type of protein molecules which they contain mitochondria it is called the energy house of the cell now you have the outer in membrane which is essentially used for lipid synthesis or the fatty acid metabolism you have the inner membrane so it is a two membrane again structured so one is outer membrane one is the inner membrane now inner membrane actually is useful for respiratory chain or atp production you have the matrix here this is used for the tca cycle and you have the intermembrane space which is used for the adp to atp conversion atp means adenosine diphosphate to adenosine triphosphate that conversion that releases the energy and which is used by the cell right so this adp to atp conversion takes place only in the intermembrane space so that is the region where this energy is produced 
Now, endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus, this view graph shows their actual morphology. Now, this entire things which is very near to this cell, this is called endoplasmic reticulum. You have some rough endoplasmic reticulum that is ER and you have some smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Then you have the Golgi apparatus which is also kind of a interconnected layer like structure and you have the entry phase, you have the exit phase of the Golgi apparatus. You have the structure of the mitochondrion which is very clearly shown here. This is a TM image and this TM image essentially tells you what is the typical dimension. This micron bar is kind of 100 nanometer. That means, this length would be roughly around 1 micron. So, this is the 1 micron that is the typical size of the mitochondria. Sometimes, this size is also important because this size will tell you to identify when you look at the cell structure that how fine or how small this mitochondria would be in real life. right? And then, inside this mitochondria, you see this is the inner membrane space that where this ADP 2. So, this is the between these two membrane where the ADP to ATP synthesis takes place and that releases energy. And this is actually reflected here in this series of the parallel kind of or concentric kind of lines here in the mitochondrial structure. Now, examples of the different cell types. Now, here I have I am mentioning that what are the different cell types that are possible. Now, if you start with the blood cells, you have the RBC which is called erythrocytes, you have the lymphocytes which is the immune system and you have the monocytes or macrophages. In the connective tissue, the first cell lies which is important is the fibroblast. You have the osteoblast, osteo means bone, a bone forming cells is known as osteoblast. Chondrocytes that is the cartilage tissue cells. So, cartilage tissue cells are known as chondrocytes. Now, you have the endothelial cells that is called blood vessels. Okay? Now, you have the neurons which is part of the nervous tissue. You have the epithelia that is either secretory cells or absorptive type of cells. You have the muscle that is skeletal, cardiac or smooth muscle cells and you have the sensory cells like hair cells or rod cells etcetera. So, out of this, what are the important thing for you to remember like erythrocytes, here it is called fibroblast, the connective tissue cells, osteoblast cell lines, chondrocyte cell lines, endothelial cell lines and neuron cell lines because in biology, you will experience or you will see n number of terminology, n number of different cell types. It is not, it is not easy to remember for a non-biologist to really remember all the different cell types. So, whatever important cell types that you would experience in your research or in your study, that is enough and that I have marked it by this star. Again, I repeat fibroblast cell lines, osteoblast cell lines, chondrocyte cells, endothelial cells, erythrocytes, monocytes, these cell lines are important for you to remember. Now, again here these major tissue types like endothelial, epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscular tissue, these are important and these thing I have mentioned here. So, epithelial tissue provides covering and these are characterized by cell shape and number of layers. Connective tissue actually provides support. So, and this support system actually that means, it can offer mechanical support for example, bones and ligaments. It can originate from the mesoderm that is middle layer of the embryo and muscular tissue it is responsible for movement like skeletal, cardiac or smooth muscle cells. So, epithelial tissue actually is like a forms like a protection from the outer environment. Connective tissue it offers you mechanical support, muscular tissue it offers you like skeletal or cardiac tissue and nervous tissue it provides you control like total control like the way you move, way you run everything is controlled by your nervous system or it provides a control of the body functions. Now, what is the typical cell numbers and human tissues? Sometimes these numbers are important so that you have a feeling that what are the typical cell densities. Cell densities can be 1 to 3 billion like 10 to the power 9 cells per milliliter. That is the typical cell densities you have. Now, the volume of a 50 kg human is like 50,000 milliliter. Okay? Now, 50,000 milliliter. Now, if 1 milliliter contains, let us say you talk about 3 into 10 to the power 9 cell lines and you have 50,000 milliliter. So, that is again 5 into 10 to the power 4. So, total you have roughly equals 15 into 10 to the power 13. 
that is the number of cells that you have in the typical human body. So, when you talk about cells, now this 15 into 10 to the power 13 cells, they are of all different types, like you have some connective tissue cells, you have some osteoblast cells and so on. So, around 10 to the power 12 and 10 to the power 13 number of cells are there in the human body. It also depends on what is the weight of a human body and accordingly total number of cells also will be changed. So, roughly for a 50 kg weight human body, you have roughly around 10 to the power 13 number of cells. Now, this shows a typically more kind of very schematic picture of the cells and here it shows again clearly that what is the three T important components of the cytoplasm. Uh, that is our cytoskeleton, that is actin filament, microtubule and there is an intermediate filament and all other typical most important cellular organs like Golgi apparatus as well as mitochondria everything they are mentioned here. In the bottom part of the slide, so what you are seeing is the lipid bilayer structure and this lipid bilayer structure contains one is the integral protein or peripheral protein and then you have the cholesterol here and then third one is that you have the hydrophobic core. So, this is the hydrophobic core region, you have one layer of protein here, you have another layer of protein here and that is why you have this different lipid bilayer protein. This is what earlier I have told you about the nuclear membrane or nuclear membrane what is the typical structure. Again, it, this membrane also has a typical bilayer type of structure. You remember mitochondria also have a bilayer structure and also the, some of the other materials also has a bilayer structure. In the nuclear membrane, you have the outer envelope and you have the inner envelope and you can see the small pores here. The small pores are actually called actually formed nuclear pore complex NPC and this NPC through these pore channels, your proteins can be transported to and from the nucleus. So, either the protein can be transported to the nucleus or protein can be transported out of the nucleus. So, this internal structure or biological structure of the different cellular organelles are important for you to understand the different kind of mechanisms that you will see in the uh, future slides that so that you will understand that and you can correlate how they can be correlated with the internal structure of the cellular organelles. So, remember nucleus just like mitochondria also has a bilayer membrane and you have a outer layer membrane and you have a inner layer membrane and inner layer of the nucleus contains the nuclear pore complex. That means, a finely divided pores it is there distributed in the nuclear pore. The other thing that is important to understand that you know that inside the cell or from one cell to another cell the protein molecules they are transported throughout the living human system. Now, how these protein molecules they are transported? For example, if you have a lipid bilayer okay, and in this lipid bilayer all these protein molecules are presented are present. Once these protein molecules are in critical number, then it form a vesicle and this small vesicle can be transported and it can be attached to the another cellular organelles and so that it can be transported to the inside the another cell. So, essentially this can go to the from the donor compartment to the target compartment. Donor can be one cell type, target can be another cell type. So, from one cell to protein to another cell protein that is possible biologically. Now, what is the chemistry of the cytoskeleton? Typically, they have shown here one for mammalian cells like fibroblasts or osteoblast cells and one is that E. coli bacterium. Now, water content is around 70 percent. So, all the cytoskeleton is essentially a water rich environment. Then what is important here, the protein content here 15 to 18 percent and then rest is you have the polysaccharides or phospholipids or DNA or RNA. So, in case of the E. coli bacteria, your DNA and RNA are all there in the cytoplasm, but in case of the mammalian cells, your DNA and RNA are mostly enclosed in the nucleus. So, essentially you have the water and this water plus proteins this is essentially the major constituents and they make like 85 to 88 percent of the total cell volume. Rest is that either DNA, RNA or some phospholipids and small metabolites. So, that is it.
that is the content for the cytoskeleton. Now, this is like a chemistry of a bacterial cell. Here you have the 70 percent water and 30 percent chemicals. Now, 30 percent chemicals means out of that you have some ions, you have some DNA and you have some RNA. So, RNA is 6 percent and DNA is 1 percent and you have protein content is the majority or 50 percent of the other chemicals is protein and that is means so, protein percent is 15 percent and your polysaccharides are 2 percent. Now, all these proteins DNA, RNA, they are called as macromolecules. So, essentially these are like polymeric materials and polymers means it is like number of mar units they are coming together and they form this macromolecular structure. This actually clearly shows, this view graph clearly shows that what is the typical structure of the cytoskeleton. Now, cytoskeleton if you remember that you know it is a very woven neat kind of formation, it is like a net. You have seen the net, in the net you have this all this either square type of net or circular type of net. So, this kind of it is like a fibrous structure like actin filaments, intermediate filaments and microtubules and this fibrous structure they are also interconnected or they are like crossed fibrous structure and this kind of fibrous arrangement any kind of physical object which has a fibrous arrangement, they can support or they can bear a lot of load. So, that is the reason this kind of cytoskeleton structure, they essentially provides mechanical support. So, mechanical support that is possible because cytoskeletons essentially you have a extremely fibers and well knit, well interconnected kind of structure. This is the typical arrangement of the actin filaments. You can see it is like a long chain like molecules like a macromolecular structure and this is here it is shown like how the different mar units they are connected to each other and they are attached to each other. And here it shows that how inside the cytoplasm how these actin filaments they really form a very close knit fibrous like structure which is distributed uniformly almost throughout the cell surface. And if you see that more relatively description of this actin filament, it has a more like helical type of arrangements. And if you look at the dimension of this actin filaments, if it is 25 nanometer, so each long chain can be somewhere around 200 nanometer. 200 nanometer means it is roughly around 0.2 micrometer. So, that is the typical length of this actin filament structure. And what is the typical mechanical properties of the actin filament? So, here it is the deformed pores and here is the deformation. And what you see that actin filament it has a more linear type of behavior like a brittle behavior. Microtubules also has a more linear type of behavior it goes to fracture and intermediate filaments has a more initially linear and then non-linear behavior. So, non-linear behavior or more strain to fracture that is possible in the intermediate filaments, but all the actin filaments and microtubules they have a exactly like brittle behavior and which is more like a classical brittle behavior, classical linear type of behavior. I think I will stop here and in the next lecture I will continue with this different cell properties. Mm -hmm.